It's my pleasure now to introduce our last speaker, uh, Dr. David Vequist, the founder and director for the Center of Medical Tourism Research, the very first academic research center devoted to medical tourism research. And the website is medicaltourismresearch.org. Very easy to remember. He's also a tenured full professor of management in the HEB School of Business and Administration at the University of Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas. So he's, yeah, he's local. This is great. So before that, he was an executive for the Methodist Healthcare, which is a billion dollar healthcare system in South and Central Texas, and has consulted in the past for Ernest and Young. He's an accomplished speaker, author, researcher, and futurist on the topic of healthcare trends, medical and retirement tourism, which we'll hear a little bit about, and health technologies. He has presented on five continents about the business of medical travel, has produced numerous articles, papers, book chapters on the subject, and is currently writing a book on the economic impact of medical tourism. I know I'm going to want to read that. His center has held several medical tourism research conferences around the world and consulted with companies, countries, and NGOs such as the UN, EU, Colombia, Egypt. Well, I could go on, but you get the idea. All over the world. And he's also going to share with us his insights on some free market successes in healthcare, which I'm really looking forward to. So thank you, and uh, welcome, Dr. Bequest. Thank you, Mary, and thank you guys for staying so late. I really appreciate you guys uh, staying here to the end and uh, bearing with me. Um, I have to tell you, I'm a little excited. Uh, just, uh, it's not that far up here to Austin, but I always enjoy coming up to Austin, and particularly being to come up here and talk about free market principles <laughs> and so close to the University of Texas. And I don't, I didn't have to get my body armor out of my car and bring my taser with worry that the, the place would get burned down by the, the students. So that was kind of nice. I like that. That's a joke, if you know. Uh, all right. Uh, so the, uh, I usually, speaking of joke, let's open up with a joke. So uh, in terms of understanding a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about, I always find a, a, a story uh, informative and uh, sometimes it's entertaining as well. So um, there once was this man that, uh, that very much wanted to be rich. He thought it would uh, be very helpful to him and his family if he could be wealthy. So what he did was he started praying to God. He said, God, you know, I'd really like to win that Mega Millions lottery that's coming up. So God, could, could you let me win that? That'd be great, right? And so he woke up the next day and he checked the paper. He wasn't the winner. And he was going like, well, maybe there was a problem. Maybe it was a misinterpretation. So he said, God, you know, you didn't listen to me very well, or maybe you didn't hear me very well last time when I was telling you that, you know, I really needed to win that lottery because it would be very helpful for myself and my family. So could you help me out this time? Can you make sure I win the lottery? He went to bed, woke up the next day, still didn't win the lottery. Now he's starting to get a little irritated. He goes, decides to have a, a frank talk with God. He says, God, you're not listening to me, and that's kind of making me a little angry here. I really want to win the lottery. And also, a loud, booming voice comes down and says, Hey, help me out a little bit. Go buy a lottery ticket at least. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're, what we're seeing worldwide is this trend of people taking responsibility for their own health care. People that are determining that the best way forward is free markets, voluntary exchanges, the, the idea of having choice in your decision about one of the most precious and awesome things that you have, which is your health. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what my center is, is tasked with doing and what I've been doing for many years now. Uh, again, as you heard, uh, one of the first, uh, the first uh, research center that's focusing on what I'm calling the trend of patient consumerism, as you see, kind of health-seeking behaviors. Um, the, uh, I started doing this research um, basically because of there, there wasn't many people out there doing this research, and so I saw that there was a need. Um, I'm part of a faith-based uh, nonprofit uh, university, so I'm, I've got a great day job, and I work maybe three days a week, 20 hours a week, something like that. It's a great job, by the way. Professor, highly suggest you try it at some point. It's a really good job. 
So, and, and what I get to do is I spend a lot of my time becoming smarter and reading about what's going on around the world and particularly in this industry. And so um, I'm really focused on the truth. I really want to tell people what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing. I, I do an analysis wherever possible and bring together both macro and micro level data and be able to bring it to people to explain what I think is happening, the, the truth. Um, I, I have uh, a great deal of background in the industry and a great deal of background uh, specifically in medical tourism. Now, I've been, been at this for almost a decade and I've worked with uh, everything from uh, prime ministers and presidents and ministers of health and tourism and uh, the UN, uh, I've been featured in the New York Times and ARP magazine. And, and again, most of the what I'm saying is things that are make people uncomfortable, particularly in the establishment aspect of healthcare. Um, but it's all necessary. All right. So this is what's going on in medical tourism, and everybody can hear me pretty well, right? Good. All right. So, all right, so essentially, what's happening is uh, technology is increasing around the world. The the uh, access to technology is increasing around world, which leads to more globalization, particularly from telephony technologies. Telephony technologies allow for data and information and, and voices to be shared, and as those get shared, it increases the globalization, the, the mixing of various different uh, ideas and uh, schemes and, uh, and technologies and business models and things of that nature, uh, which leads to more choices. Many of you actually drove here today in a car that at least pieces and parts of it were probably from all around the world. In fact, some of them are actually have a stamp on it that actually signifies the fact that it was not actually made in the United States. And even if it says it was made in the United States, most likely the pieces and parts were not. And it may have even been put together, fabricated, um, um, brought together uh, somewhere outside the United States just because of the cost of labor. So uh, most of you are probably not aware, some may be, that most of the apparel that you have is not made in the United States. So I have every day, and I ask my students this, we're very uncomfortable, and I think I could actually lose my job, although I'm 10 years, so maybe I can. But anyway, so uh, I ask my students to say, stand up and go ahead and take off every piece of clothing um, that was made internationally, just to, as a point of contention. And if I asked you guys to do that, it'd be a little chilly in here, right? You know what I'm talking about? Because how much apparel do you think is made in the United States anymore? Very good. Okay, so yeah, globalization um, leads to uh, the, uh, the consolidation of expertise in some cases, the consolidation of industries, the consolidation of, um, uh, of business models, and uh, that leads to more consumerism. So as you are looking for cheaper or better quality products and services, oftentimes you don't get all your wines from Texas, oftentimes you don't get all your cars from Texas, oftentimes you don't get all your clothes from Texas. So therefore, why do we still, in many cases, have these outdated ideas that we get all our health care from the region in which we live? It's not interesting. So consumerism is the final piece of the puzzle, and that leads to more medical travel and medical tourism. So I'm just going to briefly uh, go over the uh, healthcare situation in the United States. It's not necessarily as bad or as good as probably anybody thinks. It's a mixed bag. Uh, a person I don't necessarily agree with a whole bunch, uh, Tom Daschle, used to be a senator from, Democratic senator from, help me out, North Dakota? South Dakota. South Dakota, South Dakota? thank you, excellent. Uh, way to go deep over. Uh, so uh, he actually had a great statement about, he was going to be Department of Health and Human Services, but apparently he hadn't paid his taxes for a while, uh, or something of that nature. And uh, he, uh, under the Clinton administration, wasn't it? I think so. Anyways, so the, he said that uh, healthcare in the United States is basically islands of excellence, excellence in a sea of mediocrity. Uh, it was one of the statements I agreed with. There are actually aspects of excellence within the healthcare system within the United States. We have, uh, for example, oncology cancer survival rates that are greater than most places around the world. Although in specific areas, for example, like stomach cancers, the Koreans are better. And uh, as was just uh, said earlier, that's a lot of because of centers of excellence and because of uh, what the leapfrog group calls efficiencies of use. You know, where, where when you have a, a physician or a, an operating team that, that do a lot of surgeries, for example, they get better at it. It's like athletics, right? You practice, and what happens when you practice? Practice and you practice, right? 
Now, dude, when you practice more, what happens? You get better at it. Well, it turns out the same is true in healthcare as well. So what we see is these centers of excellence, uh, these areas where healthcare tends to get better. Um, in South Korea, uh, because of genetic propensity, they eat more fish, whatever it is, they tend to have more stomach cancers, and so therefore they are better at treating that. And so we, we have to realize that expertise typically develops where there is uh, more utilization of that particular procedure. Uh, demographics in the United States are fairly diverse compared to places that we're oftentimes compared with. Everybody goes, hey, look at the United States, spends a lot of money, but Japan and Korea, they live longer than us. And I was like, have you ever been to Japan or Korea? First of all, they eat a lot of rice, they eat a lot of fish, they're thinner, and they tend to walk more, they don't drive cars as much, and they also go to the doctor if they have a drippy nose. Okay, if, if you know anything about Japan, the Japanese go to the physician much more often than non um, uh, than occidental cultures do. So here in the West, you know, particularly men, you know, you'll have like a six-inch steel spike sticking out of your head, and you'll you go home, and your wife will say, "Hey, what's that?" And you say, "Eh, I'm just going to take a couple aspirin. It'll be fun." And uh, your wife goes, "No, you're going to the hospital because uh, women make the majority of healthcare decisions in most first world countries." And then you you finally go. But it's uh, in Japan, it's very common within the culture to go more often. So that that ties into that. The other thing is, from a genetic standpoint, most people don't realize that the diversity in Japan is almost nil. The, the majority of people in Korea, in Japan, are, I mean, Korea or Japanese, right? And so, uh, you ever, you have a Volvo, I got like a Volvo or something like that, you take it into just a mechanic and they'll, they'll spend a few hours looking it over, trying to figure out where things are first. Or if you take it to a Volvo dealership or a Volvo specialized mechanic that specializes in Swedish cars, is there any other cars? Except for Volvo? I don't think so. Anyway, uh, they, the, uh, so, is it Saab? Yeah, but they're no, they're, Saab's no longer around, right? They're, they're gone. So, yeah, anyways. So uh, it, it, it turns out that a mechanic that specializes in Volvos is more efficient. They're better at it. They actually, well, it turns out genetic diversity actually leads to less efficiency in healthcare. I didn't know if you knew that. That's actually, um, that's actually real, real life stuff. Um, healthcare cost. Uh, we do have a, an issue with healthcare costs in the United States. One of the big issues, telling some gentlemen in the back, I don't know if you guys know this, for like birthing procedures, there was a study, academic study, it was done a few years back, that found out that within California alone, there was like a disparity of like 900%. 900% in the cost of uh, the same procedure from in different parts of the state. <laughs> You get that? And that's because of a variety of issues. Um, so healthcare costs, in some cases, are not so bad. You can, uh, was mentioned earlier, the uh, surgery center in Oklahoma, which I talked briefly about, has very low rates, and then there's other places that have higher rates. Um, this uh, random critical analysis, uh, the gentleman does a, a WordPress uh, piece, wonderful, actually suggested that overall healthcare costs in the United States, sorry, don't lynch me for this, it is really not that bad. Um, the su surprisingly, compared to uh, what he calls, um, it's not cost of living, but he gets into other economic factors. But there are still efficiencies to be had, and we've heard those for years. One is which is the regulatory environment. It's been suggested recently by analysts that it could be upwards of 30 percent of the cost of the regulatory environment. Pharmaceuticals alone, my gosh, you could, it, it, there's so many ways that that could be reduced. Um, the, uh, we've already talked uh, briefly, one of the other speakers talked about the uh, litigation and uh, liability uh, aspects of healthcare, which uh, had been suggested by some people, it sounds a little high, 66% uh, healthcare cost. Um, anyway, so a lot of things going on there. Location, how many countries, let's see, let's name some countries with great healthcare according to international standards. Switzerland, yeah, right, great healthcare. Japan. Some of the longest living people on the face of the earth, right? Uh, we can go through the list. How many of them actually share hundreds of miles of a border with a third world country? Oh, yeah, no. Okay, there we go. So uh, it actually turns out that having, for example, uh, immigrants that are coming into the country, that uh, particularly from places like in Mexico, where they uh, seem genetically and culturally uh, predisposed to the areas that have things like obesity, also have an impact on the healthcare system in the United States. So I'm not saying the healthcare system in the U.S. is great. I'm just saying there are things going on. 
Um, there's also uh, some other unique situations in terms of demographics. There's unique situations in terms of the structure that we have in healthcare. Uh, the majority of healthcare facilities in the United States are private, um, and actually the vast majority of those are private nonprofit. I was talking to a gentleman from Norway once, and he was uh, he was basically horrified by the fact that we had so many people that receive um, nonprofit healthcare or there were uh, doctors, physicians, and hospitals actually donate part of their time and efforts to healthcare. I was like, you do realize that the majority of hospitals are nonprofit organizations. And he was like, well, that's horrible. It's like asking for charity. Why don't you just have people beg in the streets? I'm like, dude, you, you don't get it, do you? you? You just don't have an understanding of the, the I think it's uh, recently, uh, you may have saw the, uh, the, the Ted Cruz, Bernie Sanders debate that Paul came out and showed how we actually donate uh, twice as much, 100% more donations by Americans than any other country in the world. So uh, the idea of having a GoFundMe account to pay for health care, that's, that's not demeaning in the United States. That's called a way to get it done. Get it done, right? you know, that type of thing. So. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that uh, are good potentially in the United States, and there's a lot of things that need to be improved. So, um, and then the biggest one we talked a lot about lifestyle. Uh, John Mackey and others have talked about uh, the unhealthy lifestyle we have in the United States. A lot of that's due to lack of individual responsibility for taking care of your health, rather than hoping that uh, somebody's going to come in and do it for you. Uh, and there's a lot of bad things about that. So, what's going on in medical tourism? Let's talk about a couple. So um, most of the, um, uh, the improvements in healthcare that are occurring worldwide, even more so in the United States, in my humble opinion, and that's not good, are due to private healthcare trends, due to free market principles in healthcare. For example, the, the incredible gains that they've had in places like India, it's almost all private healthcare trends. I don't know if you know that. Uh, in, in India has never had better health care than they do now, and it's only going to get better hopefully in the future. One of the reasons is because the Indian government put in place tax holidays. They said anybody that wants to invest in health care in India, 10-year tax holiday. Um, there was a uh, piece on the Wharton School of Business site that showed that Indian hospitals were having break-evens. Any business people in the room that will love this, right? Break-evens about two and a half years. For a hospital, two and a half year break-even. Scary. Scary good. All right, so uh, the other thing is medical tourism is increasing primarily because of growing affluence. We've heard that uh, affluence means choices, and the first things that people typically do once they start to have money is first they want to get on an airplane, get the heck out of wherever they're at, and go to Disney World in Paris. And we've actually seen that Boeing a few years back said that there will never be enough pilots in the world simply because of, primarily because of travel out of Asia. People are becoming affluent, a million new millionaires in, in China. You know what they're doing? They're getting out of China, and they're going to Singapore, they're going to Thailand, they're going to Paris, they're going, I was in places like Egypt, and there's literally, I'm on a boat uh, going up the Nile, and most of the tourists are Chinese. I, mean, I was a kid, I remember when it used to be the Japanese, everywhere you go, oh, it's Japanese. Well now, everywhere I go, it's all Chinese. I'm in Barcelona, it's all Chinese in the restaurant with me. So Mandarin. So you got to know Mandarin now. Uh, but anyway, so affluence is increasing. And as you look at all the research out there, the, the, they were talking about the super wealthy. Uh, this is an article that just came out, uh, gosh, just uh, the beginning of this month. Super wealthy is going to grow, as I recall, in that, stati in that statistic, about 240-some percent over the next uh, decade or so. Yeah, so the amount of wealthy people, there's a growing, what some would call inequality, what I call growing prosperous uh, uh, generation that's happening around the world, and that's leading to more choice. People, one of the first things they do, again, is get out of the country. Well, the next things they do is they try to get better food for themselves, then they try to get better education for their children, and then finally, they can seek better health care for themselves and their family. That's the, the big things that happen under uh, affluence. So what's leading this, what's happening is patient consumerism. All right, now I want you guys to keep your minds out of the gutter. Tell me the most common things, and Armando, I think you've heard this before, so don't say it. What's the most common things that people use the internet for? Minds out of the gutter, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first thing, what do you do? Shopping. 
No. First thing. News. Not news. No. Email. Email is the killer app of the internet. Email is the most utilized function of the internet. E email. What's number two? Baseball scores. Very good. Yeah, whoever said Facebook, you are correct. My students, if you didn't say that, shame on you. All right, Facebook, social media. Social media is the second most utilized thing that people do on the internet. All right, three. We're getting in dangerous territory here. Come on. Messaging. Uh, or texting. You guys are missing it all. Uh, you guys are missing it big time. It's searching, but searching for something specifically. Healthcare. It's healthcare. Healthcare, think about it, it's ubiquitous to human nature. Um, look at some of the statistics that Google has put out. There was a, a statistic that Groupon put out uh, a couple of years back. They said, you know what, we started looking at our Groupons. It's like 60% of them are health related, health and wellness related. Look, look at, so the first thing you do, your mother, your friend, somebody calls you up and says they have a lump. What do you do? Help me out. What do you do? Airbnb. Well, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna Google it. That's exactly right. So it turns out that it's one of the most common things that people do with the internet. And by the way, mobile devices, people with mobile devices are even more likely to do it because you're out and about, you hear something, and you have this knee-jerk reaction to I need to find out what that is. I mean, I don't know, I don't know enough about it, so I'm going to look at it. That's right. All right, so a lot of the medical tourism that is going on worldwide is actually not very invasive and not very um, significant in terms of uh, the types of procedures. The most common procedure, Marilyn, uh, what, do you, what do you travel for yourself? You're close oh, to the southern part of the border? go to the dentist in Mexico. Very good. That's the most common group of procedures that people travel and for I worldwide. $225 for crowns. And, and why do you go? Because you're... Because they save 800 that's exactly, and you're, and you're close, right? You're close yeah, proximity, I'm and you can travel. And, my and you might be able to pick up some tequila while you're over there, or something like that, oh, too. Yeah, I, I can buy that, too. And, and so, I buy okay. groceries at the grocery stores, some of them are cheaper. Very nice. Okay, so the, what happens is that's very common. You can go to uh, Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. You're going to go into places like Hungary. You're going to see all sorts of dental clinics uh, close to the border, so they can get Germans. And, and British and other people that travel. Dental procedure is very common. That's because, again, most people pay out of pocket. They engage in patient consumerism. They look for um, the best provider at the best price that they can find. And by the way, that, um, we're going to talk about that briefly, but let me go ahead and bring that. Michael Porter, the father of uh, modern strategy, um, the uh, Harvard professor from the Harvard Business School, wrote a book a few years back that was not well received in the healthcare industry, where he, he talked about uh, redefining healthcare. And what he suggested is we not need to get away from this whole idea of price and quality as two separate entities in healthcare. So that's not how we buy cars, it's not how we buy clothes, it's not how we buy anything. We have price and quality go together in a mix, it's called value. You're looking for the best value, and we can't just have this uh, mundane, anti-intellectual discussion about healthcare as being something that we don't uh, consider both price and quality at the same time. It's about value. Um, so there's there's also another aspect of this, which is it's healthcare and tourism. So as you heard from Marilyn, most people that travel for healthcare, whether it's going down to Houston to MD Anderson, um, that's domestic medical tourism within the country, uh, people that uh, that travel across the border to go into Mexico, or people that fly halfway around the world to get gender reassignment surgery in Thailand. You know what they're going to do while they're there? Eat local cuisine go out and see how the local people live, they're going to visit uh, famous places, there is a tourism. Uh, our research that we did of thousands of medical tourists found that uh, more than 75% of them engaged in some form and fashion of tourism, which makes them, by the way, a much more profitable and valuable tourist than any other type of tourist. And so that's why governments fly me all around the world and ask me to, to help uh, talk about this, is because they're like, these patient these patient tourists are much better than the tourist that just comes, sits on the beach, rents a bicycle, and then goes back home. Um, they, we want people that are going to come here and drop tens of thousands of U.S. dollars. So, um, and also uh, the this patient consumerism, medical tourism, was leading all sorts of disruptive change. Um, there was a, a case that, not the case that I have the link to, but uh, that was about a, a tech 
thing. They, they got together, um, uh, primarily people that are progressive status, but they got together and they were saying, like, how can we come up with cool new ways uh, to make uh, uh, abortions more accessible to women? Um, there was uh, this one case where a Greenpeace uh, uh, lady, I forgot her name now, sorry, but I'll think of it. She outfitted a Greenpeace boat with an operating theater, parked it outside of, outside of Ireland in national waters, international waters, excuse me. And then she would shuttle people, Irish women, from the, uh, the shore out to international waters so they could have access to abortions. Ireland, if you're not familiar, um, uh, very, their uh, rule, their regulatory environment is very much influenced by their uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, traditions, and so the abortion is very difficult. So disruptive change actually happens because of things like medical tourism. Um, so uh, one of the big things medical tourism leads to is higher profit margins for the providers. Typically they are better than the government um, mandated or government negotiated rates, so therefore most healthcare providers are seeking this type of thing. Um, the state-run healthcare usually leads to lack of access. It is true, there's all sorts of data, not only from the, the UK and Canada and almost everywhere else, there's any type of socialized medicines of long waiting lines, what they call queues, um, lack of access, uh, the panels which say, Yes, certain types of people. If you're a 75-year-old man and you've been drinking all your life and uh, your liver starts to give out, you know, then in England they tell you, hey, sorry, mate, go back to the pub. Um, so they don't give you a choice. It's not up to you. And uh, so medical tourism ultimately is a complex strategy. Uh, that means that you have to figure out what you are good at, your competence, and then from there you have to figure out how to market it. And you have to figure out how to deliver value. You have to figure out how to price it. You have to, um, you have to uh, determine if you are um, uh, going against the regulatory grains of that particular country. All sorts of things involved in it. So it's not a simple business, very complex business. Um, and then typically, medical tourism, the tipping point occurs when uh, people expect you to just accept the normal. You should just accept the fact that you're going to die. You should just accept the fact that you get access to this. You should just accept adequacy. When people start to do that, that's what the medical tourism happens. And I was telling this to somebody earlier, I think John Mackey and I were even talking about this. You can't put down capitalism. Okay, this is like um, this is like Jurassic Park, Michael Wright, one of the greatest writers of all time, all over again. Okay, you can't say, hey, you know what? We're just going to keep capitalism from not happening. Guess what? Gray markets, black markets. So you can't just tell people you have to accept. You're not going to get something for your job, for your family, for yourself. They're going to find it, and they're going to go out of their way to get it. Um, sometimes uh, going against for example, legal or, legal or regulatory schemes, what my uh, good friend uh, Glenn Cohen at Harvard Law School calls regulatory arbitrage. Ultimately, we're seeing greater amounts of patient consumerism in a variety of areas. I won't bore you with all this, you can see. A variety of different areas, but here's the exciting ones. Okay, things like deaf tourism, traveling for doctor-assisted suicide, surrogacy tourism, traveling to uh, have access to surrogates, medical marijuana, gender reassignment, uh, going to seek uh, oops, uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, um, and also other types of things, things that may be illegal in your region that you can go out and get them access to. Capitalism happens, you, you can't stop it. Free markets happen, you can't stop it. So uh, you probably aware of this is from 2013, 2014. Uh, Brittany made the uh, cover of People magazine, as you see. Um, she was a resident of California. She had terminal brain cancer. Uh, she was 29 years old. She said, um, I don't want to end my life in a way that I don't choose. So she decided to become a resident of Oregon. Or, uh, if you're not familiar, Oregon allows for doctor-assisted suicide. Uh, and then she was able to end her life on her terms um, in uh, Oregon on November 1st, back in 2014. All right, so you may have seen this here in Texas uh, where Governor Perry, uh, well, well intended, uh, tried to put a law in place uh, that was trying to uh, make it so abortion clinics had to meet uh, the, the ambulatory surgery 
um, requirements. I don't have a, a problem with that overall. I found it was fascinating, though, in terms of the case law. What would happen is the a lawyer for the center of oops, keep getting the wrong button. There, center for Reproductive Rights at Women in West Texas will have to drive 500 miles to reach the state abortion clinic. That's not going to happen if you're in El Paso. What are you going to do? You're going to go across the border into New Mexico and get access to it. Uh, so the again the the thinking that, um, that a, typ a typical statist approach is, well, we're going to keep people through a regulatory scheme from doing certain things, but well, people find a way. That law was actually tossed out. Um, and also medical tourism and some of the uh, associated trends are not always pretty. Um, you have to expect that free markets and things that happen are things that you might not have thought about and you may not like. Um, so in this case, uh, the surrogacy tourism, this is baby, baby Gammy, he's a little bit older now. Um, he was born to a surrogate mother, as you probably familiar, uh, when you do in vitro fertilization, you typically will put in several, and have, help me out with uh, zygotes, am I saying that term correctly? Anyways, so, which grow to a fetus. Um, you, the reason you put in multiple, you may remember Octomom, the reason you do, uh, oops, good uh, the reason you do that is because uh, when you, uh, when you implant the uh, zygotes, uh, some of them don't attach to the uterine wall and things of that nature, so you want to maximize your chances. Well, anyways, the, the surrogate had two babies, um, one of which did not have Down syndrome, one of which did. The Australian couple showed up, and apparently there was a disagreement uh, that just brand new news that just came out. There was a disagreement between the surrogate mother and the couple, uh, which resulted in the surrogate mother taking possession of the Down syndrome baby. She claimed at the time, and all the press was at the time, that the Australian couple took the healthy baby, the non-Down syndrome baby, and went back to Australia. Uh, but now it seems like uh, the news came out that it was a little bit more complex than that. But regardless, uh, what happened is the, uh, care, the surrogate and also caregiver mother decided that she wanted to uh, become Australian or get Australian citizenship to take care of baby Gammy to have access to Australian benefits. So just remember, free markets are messy, and you're going to have things like this, and you got to accept that. And it's just part of um, the process and getting better and having access and having freedom. So uh, lots of other things going around the world. Uh, we see uh, leaders, leaders leaving country for better health care. By the way, that happened in Canada. I don't know if you remember that a few years back. It was the British, um, British Columbia, what, what do they call that? Uh, not provisional, um, oh gosh. The, the province, but the person that's in charge of the province is called, not the governor, it's a premier. Yeah, I think it is premier. Thank you. Anyways, he came across into uh, Minnesota. Oops. Again. came across into Minnesota. Do you remember what he said when the press back in Canada said, what the heck, man? We got free health care in Canada. Why the heck are you going to the U.S.? He said, my body, my choice. <laughs> so he said, uh, foreign national, by the way, in some African nations now, they have built into the Constitution that the leaders cannot go to other countries for health care. <laughs> yeah, it's true in the Constitution. <laughs> well, uh, foreign nationals uh, sneaking into other countries to get free health care seen some of that. Um, the Africans actually have a saying, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before, uh, London is a good place to die. It's actually a, an African saying. And uh, many Africans do go into, if you've seen the news coming from the NHS, they're going like, man, we're like billions in debt. We can't figure out where all, this, all, these, all these people are coming from. Uh, people getting access to drugs and procedures aren't available in this country because it's illegal. Um, we actually have had situations uh, where we've had people that have arranged to get treatment, uh, drug treatments from physicians outside the country, and they use UPS and FedEx, and they send it into the country, and they, they get it. It's because they, they obviously the Fed, feds use a audit system. They can't check every packet. Right? So they use a, an audit system, and if they don't get your drugs, then you get them. And you know, some it was written by some script uh, by some person in Japan where the uh, uh, the approval process is shorter. By the way, just real quickly about the approval process, you're probably familiar with this. Um, we're seeing an interesting, fascinating trend in India. There is a drug approval process that can be as short as you're ready for this around two years or so, two two and a half years. We're now seeing some of the pharmaceutical firms that are taking advantage of that, and they're actually going to places like India, 
and those people in India are getting access to the latest and greatest drugs years, perhaps a decade before we'd ever get them in the United States. Wow, right? Crazy stuff going on. Um, the uh, majority of Americans go to the internet to get access for healthcare, and I'm finishing up, sorry. And uh, the, lot, there's been several academic studies that show that upwards of 66%, the last one I saw was like pedi pediatric diabetic information. About 66% of the information that's available on the internet is either outdated or incorrect, or just a lie. Yeah, that's a lie. Yeah, there is stuff. So basically what I'd like to say is, uh, this is uh, from um, uh, John Goodman, who's considered the father of the modern HSA, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the health savings account. Uh, he said that uh, basically if the healthcare system is not uh, aware that it has to meet people's needs, it won't meet their needs. And uh, on the supply side, if people, if people aren't trying to meet their needs, they're not competing on price and quality and access, then they're just not going to meet our needs very well. And uh, that becomes a problem in the United States. Uh, some free market example, I'm going to cover these very quickly so we can get out of here on a timely basis, but also stay for questions. Um, uh, corporations, I got a, a great, wonderful article that was uh, that I got to write uh, for Texas CEO Magazine talking about uh, Lowe's, Walmart, Pepsi, and Boeing that are saving billions of dollars by, you ready for this, offering medical tourism to their uh, employees. Not necessarily medical tourism in Thailand or Mexico, but choosing the, some of the best surgeons in the world for a particular procedure. Um, for example, Walmart's using Scott White or Baylor Scott White down here in Texas. Lowe's is using Cleveland Clinic. And what they do is they go to those physicians and the hospital to negotiate lower rates and they give them to their employees. So you're literally somebody making $11 an hour working at Lowe's and they have a heart condition and the company comes to them and says, hey, listen, we're gonna send you a Cleveland Clinic. We're gonna pay for the flight and pay for the hotel. We're going to pay you a per diem while you're there so you can go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're also going to make sure you don't pay any co-pays and you're not going to pay anything out of pocket. We're going to cover all of that and you get to take a loved one if I didn't mention that. And we're going to cover all that because we're going to save thousands of dollars because we negotiated a rate and because it's a center of excellence and these are some of the best surgeons and facilities on the planet, lower readmission rates, lower, uh, higher rates of uh, better outcomes, all these things, it actually saves them money and they save millions of dollars by giving their employees better care. Free market, bam, done, just like that. Uh, Western Kentucky University, great article on the Drucker Institute, Drucker the father of modern management, um, uh, one of the greatest researchers in business history. Uh, they, they have this whole thing on how they use behavioral economics to reduce uh, their health care costs for employees by incentivizing them to be healthy, putting incentives and some punishments in place. Um, surgery center, which was talked about earlier, which is uh, about 50% of the cost for a really good facility up in uh, Oklahoma. Caterpillar, hot off the presses, last Monday, Business Week magazine, Caterpillar. What they basically did is they were using the PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager. They said, why don't we just skip them all together, that third party. We'll buy the drugs ourselves, negotiate with the manufacturers, get the drugs, warehouse them, and distribute them to the employees. They save tens of millions of dollars just by doing it themselves, free market basics. Boom. Done. So worst thing is, is the more entitlements we have, hey, that looks like healthcare up there. The more entitlements we have, the more we screw over future generations. Future generations bear the cost of entitlements. If, if you want to pass those on to the next generation and say, hey, I really didn't care about you very much, so here's a couple trillion dollars to pay off in your lifetime through higher taxes, keep doing what you're doing. But if you want freedom and liberty for the next generation, stop putting those costs on their shoulders. Rules, state of some impact on pricing is really obvious. A lot of different analysts have shown that the increase in the regulatory burden increased the cost of healthcare, really? That seems kind of logical. So uh, Eisenhower said, you know, the more, we, uh, the more we make the state our caretaker of our lives, much more we move forward towards making the state our master. How about this out of Hawaii? 
Okay, doctors, my last slide, by the way, my doctors can say, you know what, I think that your problem, you're homeless, the, the problem is a medical problem, so therefore I'm going to give you somebody's house. I'm going to prescribe a house. Okay, where does this end? Somebody has PTSD, and so they, their neighbors are loud. So the doctor says, you deserve a quiet neighborhood. Put those people in jail. Tell them to be quiet. Where does this end? Where, do we, where does the health of a person become something that the state now comes in with men with boots and guns, and they prescribe something that you have to do? Slippery slope. Pretty scary stuff. All right, um, sorry, last uh, thing. So liberty and free markets, all right, if we want, that's what we want, uh, we will get peace and prosperity. And that's all I got. So I, I will stay as long as you need me to answer questions. I'm sorry if I was uh, a bit abrasive and or quick, but I hopefully, hopefully you would learn some things. I got no place else to go, so just tell me if you got questions, tell me. I'll stay here until the wind of people, please come and hit me with ice sticks. What you got? You know, with, uh, you know, with so many Americans becoming so concerned about securing our poorest border. Yes, of course. Uh, what, when do you think the government is going to stop Americans from going abroad to do this? I mean, Great that's question. the worst case scenario that, you know, our border is insecure. We've got to secure that border. All right, yeah. so you ready for this? I had a, a couple, couple years back, I was having these medical tourism conferences. I'm, I'm trying to get the, get my finances in order with my center so I can uh, do another one here again soon. We invited a really great speaker, very intellectual guy, Glenn Cohen, who's uh, Harvard Law School, one of the leading researchers in medical tourism, particularly in legal terms. Um, he's already been in touch with several federal authorities, particularly in the Obama administration. He more towards the state side. Um, and one of the things that they talked about, you ready for this? Think, think like transplants abroad. You go to Pakistan or someplace where you get a transplant, they're going to tax you when you come back. Glenn Cohen has already been thinking through this and, and sending over models and ideas from Harvard to some of the uh, federal uh, agencies because they're concerned about this. Because that's literally um, a asset that you're bringing back over into the country. So they're going to figure out what the cost of a, of a new liver is, and they're going to basically charge you the tax for coming back into the country. Um, I don't know if you know this, the Department of Commerce does a study um, where they, they pull a, uh, a small, um, uh, they do an audit, a small sample of travelers internationally. And they've been asking for many years, what's your primary purpose, what's your secondary purpose for going abroad? And so we have numbers on how many people say that they're traveling abroad for health care. So the Department of Commerce already knows a little bit. I wonder if you could mention anything about inbound birth tourism. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, anchor babies. So that's yeah, so what we call them down in San Antonio and, and around the world. So yes, uh, birth tourism, very common, been, been around for a long, long time. Uh, by the way, medical tourism in general, I should explain that at the very beginning, been around forever. Romans used to go to what's now called Switzerland and Turkey um, for paleotherapy or, or spa tourism. Um, uh, when I was in Egypt, the, the country of Egypt, uh, the government, uh, this was right before the um, the Arab Spring, by the way, it was a really cool time to, to be there because I was safe. Um, and uh, the government couldn't afford to pay me anything, so they said, we'll put you on the Nile cruise. I'm like, dude, yes. <laughs> That's great. So I did Nile cruise, and I went to a temple. I was telling somebody the story. Went to a temple, and there's actually a formulary up on the wall, an ancient formulary in hieroglyphics, where they had various different uh, types of pharmaceuticals that they would produce at that temple. Uh, people used to travel. The Bible talks about the people traveling to places like Egypt for health care. So you travel from the ancient uh, civilizations to Egypt. Right? This is a very, very old trend. So uh, the question was, birth to, uh, you know, the, the, the Constitution is pretty clear about uh, the idea of being born in the United States. So therefore, we're going to see um, continued efforts by people from other areas of the world trying to come into certain countries that have those type of regulatory um, uh, rules and uh, they're going to want to be born there so they have access to all the um, advantages of citizenship. Um, I mean, 
other than a porous border, I don't know what, what, what else you do. And even if you try, um, so I had a funny experience coming back on an airplane, sorry, I got lost of stories. Coming back on an airplane um, from North Africa, um, we got uh, routed, uh, routed to a land in, I want to say it was London, I, I don't remember now, um, and it was because we had a lady who wasn't supposed to be traveling because she was probably like nine months pregnant, but was trying to hide it. And so she ended up uh, revealing her pregnancy, said her water broke, and we, we stopped somewhere so that she could have a baby in a country where now it had citizen rights. Well, thank you very much.